you don't mind my, I have a heel spur, so I'm going to sit down, if you don't mind. Appreciate it. And it's killing me. Started this new workout program, and... Mm, well, it's, I actually, it's not new. It's been since May. And uh, we went to Branson, Missouri for, for uh, vacation. We have family in Missouri. I grew up in Missouri. Sorry to get my southern accent. But anyway, um, if you've ever been to Branson, it's just, you know, hills up and down. And I made the mistake and wore Nike sandals for three days <laughs> that have no support on your heel. And I've been paying for it ever since. This was like in July. So I'm going to buy some new shoes this weekend, I think. And my tennis shoes are good. I've got all the padding and stuff in it. But my work shoes, not so good. Not so good support. So I'm going to sit down today. And maybe even Thursday if it keeps hurting. Yeah, some people told me about that. I am. Yeah, I usually buy my um, shoes at a place here in Rockford. I can't remember the name of it. My wife gets all hers there, but yeah, if it doesn't work for me, I'm going to go somewhere else. Well, the place she gets hers are really expensive. I don't, I'm, I don't treat my feet too well, which most guys don't. And so, uh, you know, I got to start treating them better. So anyway, I'll be sitting down tonight if you don't mind, and maybe even Thursday if it does get better, because I'm not going to push it. Um, so this chapter goes over system threats and risk, and uh, some of the some of the things that we need to know about it, and how to um, there's really definitions a lot in this chapter. It goes over software-based attacks, hardware-based virtualization, which is a big term you've heard of maybe. Uh, uh, you know, virtual servers you might have heard of, virtual blades, um, but those are even being attacked now because they can be, and they're out there. So malicious software, we. The reason we have antivirus, the reason we have antivirus software on our computers or anti-spyware is because of this first one here. It's probably the most prominent and most annoying and really doesn't cause much damage to your computer as much as slowing it down and uh, causing productivity to be less and less and less for American workers on PCs, basically. And it's malware, basically, that is enters the computer without your knowledge or consent General term, it's a general term refers to a wide variety of damaging or annoying software. I would say underlying annoying on that, annoying software. Three primary objectives of malware, to infect a computer system, to conceal some malicious action, and to bring profit. A lot of the, let's talk about reverse or the profit one. Um, if you've ever downloaded a program and before you knew it, it was installing 15 other programs. Nothing we thought Right? The Bing toolbar, right? The Yahoo toolbar, you know, all these. And a lot of these apps are not illegal apps or they're not, you know, really in essence bad for your computer. But when you install 10 of them at a time and they're running all in the background at the same time, it can slow your computer down. And what happens is these companies that say you download a free game, that's the most common I'm thinking of. A lot of these free games uh, during the agree button in the fine print says you agree to install all these other toolbars. And what they do, the companies get kicked back because what it does is it, it kicks a code back to those companies that you installed it because you are connected to the web. And part of that agree statement was not only that you install this, but hey, every once in a while we're going to collect some data from you on your activity with this program. One of the first things it collects is what toolbars did you install? Now, did you really know that? Probably not. Can it be fought in court and the company, the game company sued? Yeah, but the game company by default is offering the program for free. So one of the battles, or one of the benefits they have on their side going into court is, hey, we're just offering the software for free. Yeah, we add on these other things, but, you know, we're not in control of Yahoo and Bing and all these other. They're, we're just getting residual kickback uh, and the users, you know, get the benefit of the game. So you, that's why you haven't seen a lot of those things go by the wayside, even in the court systems, because of what I just mentioned. And so will it get better? Probably not. It, even with Windows 7, they're beginning to now uh, tackle Windows 7 increased security and beginning to dwindle, dwindle that down some to where it's uh, 
beginning to, you know, malware is beginning to hit the Windows 7 machines now when it wasn't when it first released. Yeah, you uninstall them. Most of these programs that I'm talking about do not hide how to uninstall those toolbars, but some of them are tricky how to uninstall them, okay? It's like you can go to control panel, add remove programs, and remove them one at a time. But if they're embedded in the app, like they call them a in-app, not purchases, but in-app um, validations. It's in-app validations, and you literally have to go in the application and check somewhere that you don't want that tool anymore. But again, you got to, you know, it might take an hour or two hours. Or finally, if you're like me, uh, if I ever, I've done these before, I just delete the whole thing. I'll go through and literally delete the program I downloaded plus all the other toolbars. I won't even mess with trying to figure it out. And then I'll tell everybody I know about it so they'll know not to do that. Uh, but no, there's, there is a way to uninstall all the extra stuff, but... As soon as programs do that, in my mind, it's kind of shady. So even though if it's a good program, um, I'll, I'll undelete it. I'll delete it from my so machine. It it yeah, now those, those are more malicious in nature as far as um, maybe trying to take over something in your computer like anti-spyware, which we'll talk about in a second. You might have heard, uh, well, well I'll, I'll save it for a little bit, but to answer your question, there is an, an easy way to uninstall everything, but there is a way to uninstall everything. So, Now, concealing the actions goes along with what I just mentioned. Concealing the fact that, yes, we're going to install 20,000 toolbars with this free game. And infecting a computer, generally not so much. 99.9% .9 of malware does not infect your computer. It just slows it down because of all the junk that it installs. But it could. It could. There is, there is variants out there that do. A virus, the next level here, programs that secretly attach itself to a document or program, and it's executed every time that document or program is ran. So an Excel document, you open it up, a virus is attached to it, it populates itself within your computer each time and replicates itself over and over again. So it might be, I don't know, a game, like I just mentioned. You start the game, and behind the scenes, it begins to execute that virus over and over again. Once a virus infects your computer, it performs two separate tasks. Replication, by spreading itself to other computers that you're connected to on the network, and also activating some malicious payload. Um, you might have remembered the 2000 scare, the year 2000. Uh, people in the computer world were warning that maybe systems will do some crazy things because of this very thing. I hear the payload activation uh, on the year 2000. 9 11 is another anniversary that seems to be a popular one for people, for hackers to uh, uh, create malicious payload. And malicious payload could be everything from uh, erasing files on your hard drive to doing screen scrapes of your monitor when it sees you goes to a secure website and sending that screen scrape to a certain email address. And the programs to use to create that are not really difficult to do. And what I mean by that is it actually will do this while you're typing in whatever. It can record your username, which you can definitely see on a form, right? Passwords are a little bit different. What they do on there is they'll record uh, keystrokes. Uh, using a keystroke logger file program. And so then they'll send that to an email behind the scenes because most everybody today anyway is connected all the time to the Internet. You're never not connected to the Internet. Even if you're not using it at home, it's still there running. The last one here, talk, talking about ranging from displaying annoying messages, erasing files from your hard drive or causing a computer to crash repeatedly over and over and over and over again and just maybe do a constant loop restart, and you maybe have seen that happen before. And those, those are called like boot sector viruses you'll learn about this semester, where it embeds a virus within the boot sector of the computer to where it's very difficult to get rid of. And there are actual programs that target those boot sector viruses called a rootkit uh, application that will go in and get rid of those. And, McAfee and all these uh, other antivirus places have them.
Now here's a here's an annoying message example. It says I think I speak for every pot smoker in North America when I say legalize marijuana, and then it goes on. I won't read all of it, but that's how they, it, it all is. Basically, a rant on legalizing marijuana. That's the message that continually pops up every time that the user runs a program or maybe logs in a computer, whatever the case may be, and they click OK to get out of it, and most people just let it go on and on and on until it does more damage, basically. So types of computer virus, um, you've got file infector, I've talked a little bit about that. Resident virus, boot virus, it affects the booting process of your system. Companion virus, uh, that is a virus that is a piggyback onto another virus. And then a macro virus, a macro, the word macro means recorded uh, steps. And so it's something that's done every time, every day, every time a program is ran the same way over and over again. You might have seen this possibly in a macro virus where you run a program, and you can actually see your mouse move and do some things. It's doing a macro. And Office, actually, Microsoft Office has built-in programming for anybody to use. You don't have to be a programmer to where you can build macros. Anybody can. Then You know, you can just search build macro in Excel, and then the first link will show you how to do it. And you can, with a macro, you can open up a web, pra web page, you can open up a program, you can start a, an FTP session, you can send an email, all behind the scenes in a macro. Finally and you, you do what now? Finally disabled that in 2010. Yeah, by default, they disabled it. You're right, in 2010. But that's not to say that you're going to still maybe get files from people that says, hey, this has a macro attached, do you want to run it? And it's, if it's from somebody you trust, um, you might run it. What I tell students, though, is even today, even if you trust a person, call them, email them, say, hey, I got this file from you we were talking about, but I noticed there's a macro attached to it. What is this all about? I don't feel comfortable opening it up. And if they say, I don't know what you're talking about, do not open it up. Because <laughs> I've actually seen the macro get attached in the transit of the email. Because um, maybe that machine, that unbeknownst to them, their machine has some type of virus that actually creates macros on the fly as attachments are attached to emails. I've seen that as well. Metamorphic virus, avoid detecting by altering how they appear. Every time it, it changes, every time you restart your computer. One of the, one of the uh, creative ones was it would rename different extensions to different other extensions. Exa example would be, it would go through and uh, the first restart, it would look at a, your documents folder and rename whatever documents were in there, rename them to a .ico, which is an icon file. And so when you want to open up a Word document or whatever, it didn't know what to do with it. Uh, it, would, it thought it was a picture, basically. And polymorphic virus encrypts what it does every time a little different. It's in a programming algorithm to where it uses, for instance, when a program runs, it says, okay, here's the time of day in milliseconds, you know, what is it, hour, minute, seconds, milliseconds, um, and then maybe uses the MAC address of your computer, the IP address of your computer, puts all that together and creates a random type of key to... Um, create this encryption. A worm, you've heard of this possibly, a program designed to take advantage of vulnerability. Um, screen's not. Screen's not advancing. Sorry. What slide is that? Huh? program designed to take advantage of vulnerability in an application or an operating system in order to enter a system. Worms are different from viruses in two regards. It travels by itself, whereas a virus member attaches itself each time to something different. Um, a worm does not require any user action to begin its execution. Actions that worm have performed, again, deleting files, allowing the computer to remote control, that's probably the most prominent. 
to where at 3 a.m. every morning your computer's remote controlled by some worm to do some function. It's generally not a person. It's a program doing something at such and such a time every day. And if it's done at 3 in the morning, it can even do it while you're logged off. You don't have to be logged into a computer. A process can run. And so most users today keep their computers on all through the night. And even some businesses, IT departments, will tell folks to keep their computers on because they do, you know, nightly updates. You know, list goes on and on of things it can do. Okay, Trojan horse. Um, Trojan horse or just Trojan. This thing's not refreshing on me. Maybe so. Program advertised performing one activity, but actually does something else. Uh, Trojans are typically executed programs that contain hidden code that attack the computer system. And then rootkit I mentioned already. This is a set of software tools used by an intruder to break into a computer, obtain special privileges to perform unauthorized admin type of actions. And all of its traces can be hidden with this type of program. Should have restarted this before class, and I didn't. The goal of a rootkit is to hide the presence of other types of malicious software. Uh, rootkit's function replaces, uh, function by replacing operating system commands with modified versions specifically designed to ignore malicious activity so it can escape detection. And detecting a rootkit can be difficult. And a lot, I've seen a lot of times on rootkits, if you don't have the right program to remove it, you just have to reformat the hard drive and start over again on rootkits. Um, it's tons easier to do that sometimes than it is to try to figure out exactly how to remove it and did I remove all of it. And so it's much better to uh, reformat because you guys can always reinstall operating systems you can reinstall programs but the one thing you cannot reinstall is data and so most of your servers you work on today in an IT department don't in essence have data on that server they have programs that are running all the time they have processes that are running all the time but data is stored externally on say like a SQL database that's backed up on a separate server somewhere else outside of that server. So a logic bomb is a computer program or part of a program that lies dormant until 9-11, until year 2000, until Valentine's Day, Christmas, any, any event you could think of, holiday event, um, U.S. history, yeah, anything like that you know, could definitely trigger it. Once triggered, the program can perform any number of malicious activities. Logic bombs are extremely difficult to detect before they're triggered because they're not triggered yet. They're only triggered on a certain event, and generally a date-time event. And then privilege escalation is exploiting a vulnerability, like uh, an example on this one would be the messenger, uh, messenger system uh, file within Windows. It's a service, messenger service system file that really is not used much anymore, but two or three years ago there was a big, um, Microsoft put a big patch out because folks could remote into this messenger uh, service easily from a, from a backdoor program like a logic bomb or a privilege escalation. They could come in and do some things maliciously to those servers or websites actually is what was targeted the most. Because, you know, websites, while my screen's refreshing, websites basically, um, the reason they're really prone to uh, attack is why you think. Why do you think websites are more prone to attack than, say, servers and networks? Anybody have thought on that? Do I know? That is attached to an attack mm -hmm. physical server as compared to jumping around the globe looking for servers. Right. Yeah, servers are more externally uh, accessed, easily accessed. 
Um, and you're right, they can get through that IP address, maybe get to other things on the, on the actual network of the system. Uh, the other reason, and it's not on this screen, is um, a hacker community has uh, notoriety in how many, say, websites they can deface in a week. How many websites they can take down, or generally not really take down, it's just deface. And what I mean by deface is, it'll overwrite the home page with an image that says, this site has been hacked by X53279GOD. That's the hacker's handle, basically. And what they do is they keep track of that, and then, uh, you know, they have a, a website, they keep track of all these uh, stats, and it's for notoriety. And it's kind of like, you know, the Olympics of hackers, basically. They keep track of all of those things. Uh, the only one I want to really highlight on this slide is the, the bottom one on the uh, U.S. Central Intelligence Agency sold a computer program to the Soviet uh, Union to control natural gas pipelines with an embedded logic bomb. This actually happened. The reason for the attack was the U.S. was attempting to block Western Europe from importing natural gas from the Soviet Union. The results, the logic bomb went off and it did cause the Soviet pipeline to explode. So it actually... Okay, the types of ex uh, privilege escalation. Privilege escalation is basically this. You... The algorithm I like to use, or the uh, analogy I like to use is, everybody has a key to their house, right, to get in, hopefully. Right? <laughs> Uh, someone, some thief gets that key and makes a copy of it somehow. We won't go into details how they did it, but they do. And you're gone right now, and maybe nobody's home. They come into your house and open the door, open the door and go into your house, and basically take what they want and then leave without your knowledge. Same thing here. Privilege escalation is on a computer, somebody fakes, well not fakes, they really log in as an administrator with the authentication, username, and password that they get. Um, and there's a lot of programs out there that allow you to do that. We'll go over some. The one we're using Thursday actually basically overrides any password on an administrator account or any other account. It just overwrites it. Okay? But there are programs out there that will actually guess. One of the programs we talk about this semester is called John the Ripper. And John the Ripper is actually will go out and search all of the known passwords for any type of password. And most common passwords today are how many characters in length that you've heard of maybe in your workplace, just around, from the bank. What's the average length that most places now want you to have a secure password to be? Eight characters. Okay, if that's common knowledge... Just that right there, programmically, is a good thing to know that I'm hacking whatever and it's going to be eight characters, at least. Majority of people, it puts, you, know, you can put more than that, but majority of people are going to do the minimum, which is going to be eight, okay? Eight characters. And what else is it in these passwords that you need to have today? Give me some more. A letter. A letter, okay, a good. Well, how about a caps? Are caps a number, symbol. sometimes two numbers, a symbol? Well, that's even more ammo now. I know it's eight characters. I know it's uh, got a caps letter. I know it has to have two numbers. I know it has to have a symbol and an eight-character password. That limits down the pool even more on the numbers uh, available. That you know maybe goes from the trillions, 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 trillions down to the billions, which, as far as time-wise, computing-wise is, you know, could mean years versus days to crack a password if you can limit it down. So the more and more, and we think, and it's not a bad thing to have what I just mentioned because before we didn't have really much at all, but if you think about it before, when banks didn't have a whatever or your, the website you log into didn't have whatever security, Hackers didn't quite know what you would use because there was no real rules, right? Now that there's rules, anytime you set rules in any system, you're up for attack. Does that make sense? It's kind of like, uh, I don't know if I asked you guys, anybody parents in here? 
or you have kids or you're or over a group of kids somehow in, a, in your everyday life. Okay, if you're like Mr. and Mrs. Friend to the kids all the time, I mean, no rules. They can do whatever they want to. You'll never get any slack, man. It's always great. It's peachy keen. <laughs> but what happens when the first rule comes down? Like, for instance, you got to be in by 10 p.m. What do they do the first time? Anybody? Or maybe you remember you don't have kids. What did you do the first time? You blow it. Yeah, you blow it. Or, you know, it might not be 10, might not be too much after 10, but you purposely make sure it might be like 10 and 30 seconds. <laughs> 10 01. You know, and why do, why does it, why do they do that? They're pushing the limit, right? Seeing where the line is. Same thing with rules we set on a network. The bad thing about that is, is now that hackers have that information and they know the rules of what people, you and I, have to abide by, and we have to abide by it to get into the account, right? We can't just make up our rules. We have to do caps letter, you know, numbers, whatever. Um, we have to abide by it, but guess what? They use that against us to get into our accounts, to get into our systems, and so I heard a talk about this the other day. It was really kind of like an hour talk on security, and I never really even thought about it, how all these secure passwords we now have to have in all these different accounts really are just that much more ammo for hackers to come in and hack our accounts, basically, uh, much more you know, easily than the, what they did maybe two, three years ago before all the security is around. Okay. Spam is the next one here. Or not. Might have to restart the thing. Okay, we're okay. Okay, how many's ever got spam before? How many even notices you get it anymore? Anybody notice you get it? Okay. Because I every year I ask that same question every semester. It gets less and less. And the reason for that is um, all the all your email accounts now, free or paid or otherwise, automatically set up a spam folder for you, automatically, and they automatically have they call it heuristics where they come in and they determine by domain of the email if it's on a blacklist, it goes into that spam folder, okay? And so most likely most of us at work anyway, very rarely even look at our spam folder. The only time we'd ever look is if somebody said they were going to send us something and we never got it. And even a lot of companies now will say, oh, by the way, when I send you this, you might look in your spam folder because it might, it might be, your system might block it, possibly. Okay? And it could happen. But unsolicited email is not getting any better. In fact, all your email filters, Barracuda is one of the most popular email filters today, and we actually have one here on campus. And Barracuda blocks around 98% of emails and flags them as spam in most corporate environments. 98% of your emails spam. And so, and if most of us have a spam folder and we never see it, especially on our free accounts, then why are they, why are they doing it? Or are they doing it as much as they were? And they are. Well, come to find out, there are folks who will go through their spam folder <laughs> as an inbox. <laughs> they see it, it's a folder, so they're going to go through it and read it, every one of them. Okay? Well, just by opening up some of these spam messages, you can get some of the things we're talking about tonight. You know, viruses, malware, uh, root kits. You, you name it, can come in. Now, the cost of spam, they have to have an email address, which anybody can get that today for free, hundreds of them, or thousands of them, or millions of them for free. Equipment and internet connection. Text-based spam messages can easily be trapped because it's scanning at all times the text of your of your email, the subject and the body both. But the, the new 
type of spam is image spam, where it breaks up the images into multiple pieces to where it's very hard or near difficult to detect in a uh, spam filter. So now spam filters have actually included now image spam as one of the blocking. Uh, and what they do is basically, and if, a, if a body of a message has no text or little text and three or four images right next to each other, it'll block it by default. Because a lot of times what will happen is, um, let me show you this screen here. Yeah, yeah. If you look at the bottom of that screen, see all the gobbledygook that makes no sense. It's just pay, it's just words. No, they're not bad words, um, but they're words purposely put in there to fake out a spam filter to say, oh, this is a real email. It's got a lot of words in it. A lot of times they take like public domain novels, which anybody can get right for free and feed it into their system public domain text, force it to the bottom of the email, and on top of the email, put together, uh, in this case, one image. You'll see in a second, they have, they've went to the next level where this was beginning to get blocked, to the next level, actually take and do what's called GIF layering. And GIF layering basically is where they uh, do what I mentioned here. If anybody played with Photoshop? Oh, there's some Photoshop people in here. You can go into an image and you can slice it. And, and, and you can do it in Dreamweaver. You can also do it in Photoshop. And it, when it comes into the page, it actually might be 100 slices coming in to load faster. Uh, it's seen as one image. And so there's filters now that to determine um, if it is a GIF layering, a word splitting, or a geometric variance. We'll look at these here. Okay, so right up here, you've got the uh, image one, image two, image three, image four, image five, image six. You notice how, and it purposely does this in the slide to show you how they're split. You wouldn't see it like this in an email. They would all be together right on top of each other. But this is how it's loaded in the email, okay, one by one. And filters took a while to grab onto that, but they've done a pretty good job now. Most of us don't get these. You might get one slip through once or twice a month at your workplace still because they think of different ways to split the image and different text to put in, different subject lines, different domains of emails. So these marketers are constantly changing and morphing because guess what? What I just showed you last few slides is the number one money maker in the world is what I've just done right here. Getting and sending out bulk spam email. The reason for that is this. Um, Companies pay big money to marketing firms to target, you might have heard this in any of you take business or marketing, to target their audience, right? 18 to 24, 25 to 45. Uh, you're into sports, you're into medicine, you're into whatever, religion. Uh, where, you know, what, where, what region you live in the nation, how many kids you have, what your educational background is. All these demographics I'm mentioning go into a database and companies say, I need you to target this age range with these interests, and I'm going to pay you $5 million for the next two years to bulk saturate these folks. And they'll do it with email, mail, because you still get junk mail, what we all do, right? And not, not as much maybe, but I think actually it's actually got worse. I think your mail and your mailbox, physical mailbox, has gotten worse in the last couple of years than it, what it was. Uh, one of the reasons for that is the companies are not seeing as much of a return on the emails because a lot of people, like you guys, don't check your spam folder for spam mail, right? Your filter's catching it. So they're having to resort to the old-fashioned bulk mail, which is the same thing. Do you ask for the ad? Do you ask for the ad about the magazine and about the whatever 
sale coming on. Because if you think about it, sales to J.C. Penney, Sears, which we all go to, or you know, a lot of us still go to. You know, what do we do with that generally? Trash, right? Do we ask for it? No, but it's the same thing. What we get in our box at home, a physical mailbox, is the same thing as mail, except this money here from email is much cheaper for a company. It's cheaper for me as a company, as a marketing company, to, to get your $5 million. It doesn't cost that much money to create a marketing campaign with a database to send emails out. Because you can sell, buy and sell emails. Just the buying and selling of emails is also a multi-billion dollar business. Because those emails have tied to them demographics. Anytime you fill a form online, you'll notice at the bottom of the form it says, by default it's generally checked. Uncheck this if you don't want this sent to other people. And what they're doing is selling your data. Companies sell your data when you fill that form out. You might just be filling a form out to, I don't know, find out about a new product or whatever. Or, hey, when is this new phone coming out? I'm going to fill this form out, first name, last name, address, email, phone number. Oh, by the way, since we're going to give you this information, would you mind us, uh, you know, sharing your information with other companies of like type of, uh, you know, product or whatever the case may be? And most people will be like, eh, yeah, why not? It's free. Who cares? And then you notice a whole bunch of stuff maybe coming in your inbox or in your junk mail filling up quicker. They just sold your data to another company. And again, that's how they make the money. And so that's why I say this right here is the most day, even though most of your spam filters block 98%. One of the things you have to remember, though, too, is everybody that fills out a form or people that fill out a form Shouldn't be doing it at work anyway, right? <laughs> so when folks fill out a form, they're generally using what email address, or they should be anyway. What, are the, what email address are people using or should be using? Their personal. their personal email address. Now, give me some popular email accounts, Gmail. popular ones. Gmail's a popular one, right? Yeah. Yahoo. Hotmail. Hotmail's still pretty popular, right? Yeah, Hotmail's still pretty popular. And I said AOL is even still popular. And so all these I've just mentioned, there's there's filtering on the web. For most of these I, that you guys mentioned, there is pretty good spam filtering on most of those that you've mentioned. But what people will do is they'll port those emails to their phones. And when they port those emails to their phones, if they don't if it's not set up right or they don't follow the steps of how to set it up. A lot of times, all the mail will come into your phone's or mobile device inbox. So where are the number one ways that marketers are getting folks today is not through the web-based mail, like going to gmail.com or going to aol.com or wherever else you mentioned. It's their mobile device. Because 78% of students today check their email on a mobile device. 78% of people in college, 18 to 35, I think, is the last stat I read. 78% and probably higher in some regions check all of their email via a mobile device. And nine times out of ten, uh, those filterings are not set up properly, and so they're getting all the, all the junk, basically, in their inbox, a lot of them. And so that's where they're getting uh, their sales, basically. Because it's been proven in marketing, if a person sees an image twice, okay, twice, within like about a two-day period, 30, 40, 50% of those people will pursue the next level, like going to a website, going to a store to look at the product. And so they know that they can get the image in your face twice, you know, they can maybe sell a product. But irregardless... The marketing companies are making money just by you clicking on an email or clicking on an ad to um, okay. This is the last one of geometric variances. Basically, this one's what they do is it makes it look kind of like a texture background. If you can see that, that basically it's. 
putting in um, an ad or something in a, a weird background, like a textured background. Is that to stop OCR? Yeah, yeah, OCR, because it's picture, basically. Um, and not only that, but you'll notice the breaks in the text. Even if it's text-based here, that they could, could scan it. Notice the breaks in the text. It's hard to, yeah, OCR, it's hard to come in and scan that and determine what the font is or what the letter is. And so that's, that's another real popular one, too. The number one of all these I mentioned, marketers, marketing types, are like the Viagra type uh, companies. Are the number one, Cialis, Viagra, are the top two multi-billion dollar marketing scams, basically. Um, because people do buy those products, and they're valid products, uh, but they just constantly flooded the market. Email, your mailbox, not so much mailbox, they generally do this in email. I have seen some in mailbox, though. Commercial, I mean commercials, right? How many commercials on a, on a Super Bowl are covered in Cialis and Viagra type commercials? I mean, like every other one just about. Um, and commercials on the Super Bowl are pretty pricey to get a 30 second spot on a commercial time frame. Yeah? Can a company like Yahoo sell you an email account to, to the marketer? Uh, generally, they don't do it that way. No. What they do is they'll go out and buy a domain or a free domain. Uh, and domains are like a dime a dozen. Domains are so cheap to buy. If you've never bought a web domain, you can go, go out and buy a web domain for five bucks. And a year domain for a year. If you want five years, five bucks, uh, tw 20 bucks, 10 bucks, 15 bucks, whatever. The more years you get, and they generally don't buy a longevity because these uh, Barracuda type devices will figure it out and block them pretty quick. So what they'll do is they'll go out and buy literally thousands and thousands of domains, these marketing firms will, and just keep changing them. Boom, keep changing them. You change them every day. Change them every day. Same ad, just different domain. And if it takes one day for Barracuda to block it, that's one day that they've released out into the world, you know, billions of emails possibly. So it's worth it to them. So image spam cannot easily be filtered based on content of a message. To detect image spam, one approach is to examine the context of the message, like who sent it, email domain, what is in what is known about the sender? Because if you just do a whois.com, literally do a whois.com and type in the domain name, you can determine who bought that domain. Where does the user go if if she responds to this email? That's a good uh, indicator. If it's a website that says, I don't know, I'll give an example, Netflix.com dot one three five six x dot a b c d e f g dot you know all these that's generally a red flag that um, not going to do anything to your computer but it's a marketing type of email basically Netflix yeah yeah exactly it, they're keeping track of what you're clicking on because they have to keep track of it to prove to the company that you indeed did click on that link does that make sense Google does this too with AdWords. People spend millions of dollars. I've done some Google AdWords account before. And you spend money and you pay for the clicks that you get for your website, which hopefully generate revenue. And so it's not a bad thing, like I said, but most people um, complain about Google ads. It's actually not as bad as it used to be, how they do it now. It's like you'll notice when you do a Google search, if you go home tonight, and just do type in whatever search you want to search for the first page will generally have the ad, but what they've done is they've started getting rid of the ads on the second, third, fourth page, and then maybe bring them back on the fifth page. Then they're gone on the seventh and the eighth page, bring them back on the ninth. You know, they just kind of, you know, kind of twist it a little bit, and make it different to where it's, you know, not as annoying as what it used to be. But the one place that ads have not yet hit, and it's coming, and it's actually coming through like program or websites like Facebook, is mobile devices. Mobile devices have really not yet been hit yet with ads. They're, it's coming, though. Facebook already has it. It's already in the works. They're already rolling out beta in certain regions. And what will happen is you'll get the little ads at the bottom of your Facebook, whether it be a Facebook app or a Facebook web page on a mobile device, 
you will get ad generated uh, because majority of people, again, not to say people don't go on Facebook on desktop or laptop, but majority of people use Facebook go on mobile devices, right? And so because of that, m the people they make money from on their ads are saying, uh, we're not getting our return here. And so they're having to push it now to the mobile devices, which I knew that was going to come, that was going to happen. Because um, Facebook, that's how they make money, is through ads. You know, people say, how does Facebook make money? Well, you, you probably don't see it, but go to your desktop, because you never check it there, and fire Facebook, and you'll see a whole bunch of ads come up. And, you know, you can be an educator, you can be a lawn business, you can be, you know, a student. And what are you going to get? If you're a student, you have a .edu address as your, as your uh, Facebook uh, email. You'll get a lot of ads pushed for students, basically. Um, but you, you guys all do. You know, you go up and set up your profile or whatever. You know, I go to Rock Valley College. That's my network. I go to, I work at Rock Valley. I work at Sunstrand. I work wherever. Everything you put in that profile puts you in a certain demographic for to be a target for a certain ad, which isn't a bad thing, like I said, but that's how they make money. Yeah, and, and what you like, yeah. Exactly. If you like a rock and roll, if like I like some rock bands and some people that, you know, play guitar and uh, artists, so I get some ads on the desktop about music and things like that. And so, yeah. If you go through and actually play with their ad creation tools, it's amazing because you actually get a glimpse of how they treat the user accounts. Exactly. Um, although they aren't selling, you know, John Doe lives at 12345. Yeah, they are. Plus. Yeah, you're they, right. They, they, won't, they won't sell that list. No, but they use it internally. They'll say, we have this many accounts at this profile. Mm -hmm. And you can say, you know, I want somebody in, you know, Ontario, Canada, who likes, you know, buying their music from Amazon. Yeah, you put little keywords in there. Yeah, you're right, yeah. And then if you go and, if you go and play with your own profile, it will change automatically. Yeah, exactly. Well, you, can, you can add yourself or take yourself out of that. So yeah, it's it's a money maker for sure, and like I said, it's not a uh, I'm not against it because I know that that's how they make money, and and the ads are, and the service Facebook people like and and use, and so folks to use. So I understand all that. Not my, I don't have a problem with that. Um, it's when I'm given something, that, uh, really even the emails anymore don't really bother me because like I said, most most of the emails that I get and you get um, are in the spam filter folder anyway. Okay, spyware. Uh, this term really hasn't popped up too much lately either. I'd say in the last year it's gotten less and less in some realms. Uh, I think it's because most of your anti-spyware anti software, anti-virus software does a pretty good job of blocking this. Not to say you won't get spyware anymore, but it's kind of backed off the last year. Basically on this one, on the highlight of this page here, is the second bullet there on anti-spyware coalition to find spyware as technologies are deployed without the user's consent and impair the user's control over use of your resources of your system, including what programs are installed on their, on their systems, collection use and distribution of your sensitive information. Now, sensitive information could be what is your web history? What is your web history in Safari, in Firefox, in Chrome, in whatever that you use? And they can send that history to use it for marketing purposes, but did you give them the rights to do that? Um, or do you know you gave them the rights explicitly, even though it might be in the fine print that nobody reads? Uh, material changes that affect their experience, privacy, and, and system security all have to do with anti-spyware and spyware. Um. So spyware has two characteristics that makes it really dangerous. The first is profit, which that's a no-brainer. All this stuff we're talking about, for the most part, um, is going to have to do with profit. Saw something the other night. Money is evil. A lot of money is evil. Well, yeah. I mean, greed, money, that, that costs people business to do. Um, 
you know, maybe off-color things that they maybe normally wouldn't do. But spyware creators are motivated by profit. Spyware is often mo more intrusive than viruses, harder to detect, and um, difficult to remove. There is a software program, uh, antispyware.com, superantispyware.com actually is a website. It's a really good website. They got a free version and a paid version. And again, superantispyware.com. It's a pretty good one if you ever do find spyware. It'll just, it's a one, you can run it whenever you want to. It doesn't run all the time. You can set it up to run all the time, though, and buy a pro version and all that good stuff. But I have used this on people's computers that are chock full of spyware. Generally, spyware is found when people use peer-to-peer -peer software programs like Kazaa was a real popular one back in the day, LimeWire, uh, Gutenella. Uh, these are peer-to-peer uh, programs that people use to download uh, pirated whatever music uh, movies spyware is very widespread although attackers usually use several different spyware tools the most common in the hacker world is going to be adware and key loggers adware is pretty much gone for the most part key loggers not so much there are some really nasty key loggers out now that actually are embedded on web pages, game, game websites actually. And I always tell students to stay away from game websites that are not known corporate game sites like EA Games. You're okay there. Uh, but you know, you get in some of these off-color game sites that have online games, this is where you're going to get all the junk. Spyware, uh, key loggers built into games, and the key logger actually runs and is installed when the person installs the game. And once a key logger is installed on your system and it runs in the background, you can generally, it doesn't really cause system resource issues. It just records your key strokes whenever something happens. Generally, it's when it's, you see a web session where the website, it sees a web session where it starts out with HTTPS in the web session. It begins recording keystrokes um, and then sending those keystrokes to a certain uh, email address. Right here, uh, this is having to do with the profit of malware. And I'll restart my computer next time before we, on Thursday. Okay, this slide basically just goes over some malware effects and explanation. I'm going to talk about two of these that are probably the most common. Uh, anybody had a friend or family that said, hey, my computer is like, wow, dirt slow. <laughs> my computer is dirt slow. Anybody had that happen? Uh, can you please fix it? Can you please fix it? When that happens, generally that's a spyware issue for the most part. Okay, spyware, malware kind of merge in this one. Spyware can increase the boot time. They say my computer takes, you know, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes to boot up. And you can run programs like Super Anti-Spyware and that can uh, fix it. System instability. Spyware can cause a computer to freeze frequently or even boot. They're doing whatever on the internet and it just their their keyboard freeze, their mouse freeze for just a second. And they go, you know, what happened? And then they just say, Well, I'm gonna get a cup of coffee and come back and be ready to go. <laughs> and that's what a lot of people do. Yeah, yeah. Was, I usually, you know, it takes 15, 20 minutes for my computer to reboot. I just go get a cup of coffee and come back and we're good to go. Hijack web page, I've already talked about this. Home page, an unauthorized change in the default home page caused by spyware. And then increased pop ups. Anybody had any, have any pop ups on your computer lately? You did, you used some lately? And what would you mind telling us what it was, what pop up, what they were? I don't know, because I don't let them load. Okay. I shut them down. Okay, but you got a few. You know, I've noticed a few even on the Mac side. Mm -hmm. That's where I was getting them at. Is that where you're getting them at? Mm -hmm. Okay. Because I noticed a few pop-ups on a Mac for the first time um, on an instructor station, 
And I forgot what website I was at. I think it was like, a, a, I don't remember, it was an, uh, like a Lydia. It might have been that Lydia, you know, that video tutorial place. Linda. Linda, Linda.com. Might have been that one, possibly. Do pop up those videos maybe, on maybe that's what it was. I think I was doing, like, travel plans, and I got, like, a Netflix pop-up. Yeah, like, oh, right in the middle of your screen. I'm not yep. looking at you. Exactly. Right yeah, you're right. But, but I've got a lot of them for travel. Yeah, 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 I've, I've seen a few. And and what it does is they'll work with the, the browsers now to where they will um, basically do some type of um, scripting within the browser to where it pops up after a minute you shut the browser down, it pops up a pop-up. It's a built-in script in the browser that it runs. So they're always finding different ways to do things. And so to end this, basically, security when it comes to malware, viruses, worms, trojans, is stay away from websites that are dark in nature, I'll say, or uncorporate websites, kind of private sites. Um, and that could be a, probably the most prominent, it would be, be gaming sites for sure, um, videos, cat videos, <laughs> any type of place that you can find weird videos. YouTube's generally okay. But there's a lot of video sites that are non-YouTube video sites. Adult entertainment. Yeah, adult entertainment types, which we won't go into. But yeah, there's a lot of that out there. And you can mistakenly stumble onto those. I mean, it's not something you can purposely, you mean, you can purposely do it, but you can also mistakenly go onto these just by searching for, hey, I'd like to find a video of George Washington. And you click on something and it's a pornography site. You know, you know George Washington does Dallas or something. I don't know. Um, you know, <laughs> I don't know why I said that, but it's it could be that. Uh, and you're like, what? The real popular one when I was a high school teacher was White House White House uh, website, not on WhiteHouse.gov, is WhiteHouse.com. That was a big one, like fresh when I taught freshman year high school. And the secretary in the office, I I, I was like a good 50 yards from her office. And I heard a scream so loud that it hurt my eardrums. And I was like four rooms away with concrete walls in between. And she had, I don't, not only the website was up and she couldn't get it to shut off, but some student had sent her a link in, I think at that time, his AOL and some messenger was real popular back then. And in the link, the student had a profile. And in the profile was a web link. She clicked on the web link. And it filled her screen with pornography. It just filled it with pornography. Because he had gotten hacked by one of his buddies. Thought it would be funny to put one of these links in his profile. And so she not only had the White House website, she had all this pornography <laughs> popping up all over her screen. And she finally, well, not, by the time I got there, she had just shut the monitor off and was crying in the other room. <laughs> <laughs> Did she shut the speakers off? <laughs> And so we took care of it and made sure that we kind of, after she calmed down, let her know it wasn't her fault, kind of, you know, helped her understand what happened and why it happened and she didn't do anything wrong that, you know. And so, yeah, you'll get that happen as, too, uh, as well. I've even seen myself click on things. I'm like, uh, no, uh, you know. And so you can usually tell when it's loading, right, when it's loading if you don't, if you're not real careful. Um, and so... You know, game sites are probably the most prominent one for malware, viruses, things like that. And definitely, and I know you guys don't do this, but I tell this to every one of my networking students, stay away from any type of peer-to-peer -peer website ever. Don't go to them. Because in an IT perspective, even today, when we have to fix computers, the number one reason is generally either games, number two behind that is some type of peer-to-peer -peer something people are trying to do and get for free. And you, it ends up costing them. You know, it's better just to go out and buy it. <laughs> I had a teacher at Hanamiga who had to have his own user um, profile policy because